everyone. I, uh, I know I have a lot to, to uh, follow up after, but I have to tell you I'm a proud owner of ADDism. Yeah. And, yes. uh, and I'm a man of many failures that I've learned from, and, uh, and that came in the form of Blue Jacket Inc. The, uh, I'm up here to tell the story of Blue Jacket Incorporated, and, uh, but I, I guess first I have to tell you the story of its founder. 20 years ago, and I know I don't look that way, but 20 years ago, last month, I was a sophomore at a local parochial school. And uh, it was Friday afternoon, and we were walking into uh, uh, a weekend where there was this hush and murmuring in the hallways, and you know how that kind of happens, how rumors just kind of filter right down the hallway, and then it ended at me where, of course, the rumor was that the vice principal was bringing in 60 people who were at a drinking party uh, the month prior, and I was one of those 60 people. Actually, 10 people were, t were brought in that Friday afternoon, and the word was, if you lie, you can get out of it. Well, I was the only sophomore at the party. I had an older brother who just graduated, and it didn't really matter. I made a mistake, right? So I was a, uh, I was a, uh, a bit of a hellion in high school, I can tell you. I ended up being that way. But uh, I also had a very good home. And I'll tell you about how this crafted me and crafted my, my experiences in my, in my world to be able to lead this uh, social enterprise called Blue Jacket. I, uh, I, it was Saturday morning, and for the next 24 hours, actually those 24 hours, I was trying to concoct all the different stories I was going to tell my parents, because my mother was the Gestapo, and my father himself was a hellion. Of course, I was just following in his shoes. So I had to figure out, what was I going to tell my family? Because I did not have the option of not telling them, because my coaches and teachers would probably have told them by Sunday afternoon. And I had three other options. One, of course, was to tell the truth. I was there and drinking. The second was to tell the partial truth, as most teenagers would probably want to be able to do. And the third was just to lie and say I wasn't there. So of course, the third was out. And I realized in my first 16 years of experience living in that household to never, ever take them by surprise, kind of like the time that my dad's favorite baseball ended up in my neighbor's window. And I didn't confess to that, nor when I stole his car when I was 13 on a joyride when I thought he was supposed to be out of town. <laughs> never take my father by surprise. So. I, uh, I came down and, uh, and I realized the best time to be able to tell them that I was going to be called out on the carpet that Monday or Tuesday was when they were getting ready to go out for the evening. So as my mom just got done drying her hair, the door was open, I remember this vividly, I leaned against the door frame and I said, uh, Ma, uh, I'm going to be called out on the carpet on Monday. I was at a drinking party uh, a month ago. and. Uh, I just wanted to tell you. And as I started kind of backing out of the room, <laughs> she stopped brushing her hair and looked out of the corner of her eye and she said, were you drinking? And of all the options that I thought about, those 24 hours, I thought of all the possible configurations of lies and fabrications and truths and mistruths, that was not a question I was expecting. So of course I fumbled and I bumbled and I'm like, uh, uh, and she said, be quiet, son. You know what to do. And that wasn't the response I was looking for. So then, of course, I continued to walk out, and then I thought, hey, I know what she's going for, but I still have an ally, my dad, the Hellion. And he was out fixing the boat in the driveway, and of course, he was last minute type of guy like me, and he's, uh, he's working on the boat, and I remember leaning up on it, Dad, I want to let you know that I'm going to meet with the vice principal on Monday or Tuesday for being at a drinking party. And he looked up, and wrench fell, and he said, how drunk were you, boy? <laughs> That's not the response I was looking for. And I fumbled and I bumbled, and of course he said, you know what to do. So then I turned around and I walked away and I knew what they were saying. Because those 16 years, and Mr. White, I, God bless you, sir, I saw you walk in. Those 16 years, I did have the fortune of having a family, a support system who developed me the right way. I was one of eight people that went in and told the truth that next Monday. <clears throat> 52 other people did not. Now I know, well, 52 other people did not get busted, but uh, a large portion of them were drinking. I was there drinking bongs and the whole nine yards. It wasn't very good for me to be able to do that as a sophomore in high school, of course. And I was misguided, I was misled, but there was one very important component that I learned at that time, and that was to take responsibility for my actions. What I had that those other 52 people did not have was the ability to raise my head up high and take responsibility for that, 
but also to own up to the punishment that I deserved. In my community, I let them down. My coaches, I let them down. The student council, I let them down because, and I wasn't angry for this, I was punished, I was suspended from wrestling, I was suspended from football, I was, I was kicked off a of student council, I had to write letters of apology, and this was for a victimless offense. But that built the foundation for me to live my life and for Blue Jacket to be able to say philosophically, this is how we need to be able to treat people with felony offenses. Now, I'm not gonna say that I haven't made a mistake since that time, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've, uh, uh, yeah, hurt a lot of people. But one thing that I've learned early is that the, the pathway of transformation starts with me and my ability to take ownership over that action that I have. So, <clears throat> Blue Jacket, I mentioned it was a social enterprise, but I should probably fast forward another eight years. When I was graduating with my master's thesis in fine art, the first thing that I wanted to tell you, me being hopefully to innovate you and to inspire you, is I am living that changing the fucking world. I am doing that. I would have never said that word, but you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living my passion. I'm not making a lot of money because, of course, I'm working for a nonprofit. But I'm there because I didn't realize that the opportunity was sitting right in front of me the entire time. And the harder that I worked against it and ran away from it, kind of like Jonah did from Nineveh, if any of you are scriptural, I am the person who continued to go, uh, continued to be forced into this path of working at Blue Jacket, and it's been the greatest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Eight years later, I'm graduating with a master's. I'm having to work with my, on my thesis. I'm a graduate assistant, but I had no money. And so I was gonna work third shift for my mother. And of course, I had three vows. I was gonna be that tenured professor teaching art and critiquing sculptures and paintings and prints for the rest of my life, sitting in my lounge chair, sucking on my cigar, right? That's how I was gonna live the rest of my life. And second, I was never gonna work for family. And third, I was never gonna work for them criminals. Never, ever, because my mother, she's a director of Allen County Community Corrections. They oversee a lot of probation and house arrests. They oversee alternative programs. And I was never going to work there because I grew up in it. She's been there 27 years. So when I was in elementary and high school, I had people sitting in my dinner table that were like ax murderers. And it's just something I thought, that's not what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, so of course, I had, God had another plan for me. <clears throat> I started working third shift. And being that I was working in county government for my mother, of course, they frowned on nepotism. And I was working third shift. But being that I was the son, I had to work three times as hard as anyone else. And the harder I worked, the more the clients saw me as someone who loved to be around them, to love to feed off of their transitions in their lives. <clears throat> the advisory board of community corrections and the judges and some of the, uh, the commissioners and advisory boards, they all started seeing that I was working really hard and I loved what I did. So then, fast forwarding another six years, at community corrections, I became the director of programs. And so I oversaw all the programs, programs that were there to transform someone so that they wouldn't have to go back to a life of crime again. We don't want to feed the prisons. We don't want to continue to push people back. And did you know that Allen County has 1,200 people coming home from prison every year? And did you know that Allen County is the second in the state on sending people back to prison? They're called technical violations, but it's when someone has uh, you know, does drugs on parole or probation or, you know, don't pay fees or they end up committing a new crime. My charge was to help prevent that. <clears throat> and one of the most feasible solutions to be able to do that was to target what are the sig significant factors that prevent people from committing crime. What do you think those are? What are the top three that you think prevent people from committing crime who have been convicted of a crime before? It's called recidivism or or some people call it relapse, but it's recidivism. What do you think those three factors are? Having a job, job. Job, right. What else? Long-term support. Yes, long-term support, or family. 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 family support system, that's big. What else? Purpose. Pardon? A purpose. A purpose, absolutely. Housing. And housing. The three, the three biggest, but purpose, I think, goes into employment as well, right? And family and housing. That is exactly right. You guys are right on it. <laughs> 
So of course, I had the charge to be able to go around, and at this time I'm working for a guy by the name of Judge John Serbeck, innovative, problem-solving court. I had to work for him and develop these programs for people coming home from prison. At the time, 60% of the people were unemployed, whether they left the day of or six months later, they were unemployed. Now that's 60%, this is in the hundreds of people that are 70% likely to commit a new crime or go back to prison if unemployed. Those are big numbers. So something needed to happen. And we went around a nine county region to say, would you partner, would you provide your workforce services or nonprofit services or faith-based services to these men and women coming home from prison? Because if they're not employed, they're stealing from you. They're raping you. They're hurting your children. Can you help us? And it's not that they didn't want to, they didn't have the capacity to deal with the men and women coming home from prison with the myriad of social issues that they have to confront. Their families are strange because they're also victims of someone's poor choices, right? They're sitting in jail knowing that they victimized their family because now they have to cover the bills. They have to make rent. They have to pay the light bill. But not only that, the community doesn't want to forgive them, so they come home without hope anyways. So the most feasible solution back in 2003, at this time, was to create our own nonprofit. I could tell you a big long story about how that came about, but non this nonprofit is an independent 501c3 that has a mission to provide the tools and opportunities to adult ex-offenders to be productive members of society. A lot of words to say, we hold them accountable. And the first R, remember what the first R is? Relevant. Relevant. What's the single most relevant thing for someone coming home from prison needs? A job. So we created this 60 hour program. It's the, it's the funnel to everything else at Blue Jacket. And it's based on philosophy. It's not based on, can you get the skills of being good at job searching? Because we don't make criminals smarter criminals. That's what a lot of people have misallocated their assumptions of what Blue Jacket does. No, in 60 hours, you have to show up dressed like Tony business professional every day, on time, with your assignments complete. It doesn't matter if, you, matter if you can read the side of a bus or not. If you're a minute late, guess what? I bet you Marshall Watt has the same type of standard. You see what he can do, but you know the reason why we have that standard. Take a guess. It's that path of redemption. It matters less if you're an employer and you say, no, I don't trust them criminals. I don't want to forgive them. They violated a public trust, and past behavior predicts future behavior. I don't trust them. It's not on the onus of the employer to have to trust that person. It's on the onus of that person to be able to walk the path of redemption. Because it matters less what you say as much as what you do. Would you agree? Yes. And you are watching their actions the minute they hit the, hit the door, the minute they come home. Are they reformed. But you know reformation takes a lot of time. It may for some people. So what we have done is constructed this career academy. And people do show up two minutes late. And people do drop out of the process. We give them a second chance, but they do drop out. And what that says to us is if you are motivated to become employed, making it relevant, then adapt to this culture of the workplace. You won't be, you may not become a banker, you may not become an attorney, maybe an entrepreneur, and we're developing programs for that. But if you can graduate the 60-hour training, you can tell yourself, you can tell the community, and you can tell that employer that you're serious about that second chance. And that is why I'm so blessed to be a part of Blue Jacket, because we provide that catalyst for them to be able to walk, walk the walk. Now, some people still walk the walk, and, and my staff are trained, and I, and I have to take a step to the side and say, there are three barriers that we've confronted with Blue Jacket when we see this. We've had 22 formal requests in other counties around the straight state to replicate. We keep telling them, no, we want to become good in Fort Wayne. We serve 300 people per year. And of those 300 people, 9% recidivate or get rearrested for a, new, for a new charge, whether they're found guilty or not. Now that's incredibly low. Do you know what the expectation is for them? The expectation is 44% are supposed to commit a new crime, but 9% of Blue Jackets do. Something good is happening. However, that's not good enough. And what we found, the three biggest barriers to people's reintegration from prison to employment or to family or to sobriety 
Most importantly, yeah, well, it comes from them. But the biggest barrier, three mindsets, it could be the employer in the community. It could be the client. But, but I think the biggest barrier is the practitioner. It's that pastor who's walking alongside the person helping develop the resume. It's the, it's the blue jacket staff person who's sitting in a, and trying to help the person. It, it could be a family member. It could be a workforce development professional. But across the board, we've seen the success in the nation when the practitioner has what my school had when I was a sophomore. See, they could have kicked me out. And I'll just tell you, it's Concordia. Concordia Lutheran High School, right? Concordia is a wonderful school. They could have kicked me out, but they didn't. They gave me a second chance. In my junior and senior year, my grades increased. I excelled in athletics. I got back on student council. I earned my seat back. And it was the people who were sitting in those seats. It was the practitioner. It was my family who supported me. It was the vice principal who said, you're in trouble. I'm going to hold you accountable, but I'm going to let you stay here. I'm going to give you a second chance. And how many of you have had your trust violated? How many of you have violated another person's trust? Many times, and, and I'm not asking you to forgive individuals, but I know that in forgiveness there's freedom. And I know that an employer and a community member who can forgive someone coming home from prison and say, you know what, you wronged me or you wronged my relative or you wronged someone else, show me what you're doing to change your ways. And if, as long as they're embracing, and there's thousands of things in Fort Wayne, wonderful halfway houses, wonderful substance abuse uh, agencies and mental health agencies and uh, agencies around town that can provide those services. But if they're walking the walk, that gives you an ability to be able to make that true assessment. So I stepped aside and I said, and I, you know, ADD went off, the practitioners are the missing link. The people who want to give that second chance are the missing link. Because we also see the practitioner not only over holding them accountable and making it too difficult for them, but enabling them and doing the work for them. So, what is Blue Jacket? All right, so what is Blue Jacket? What's the name Blue Jacket named after? Anyone know? The Indian Chief. Yeah, you already knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is named after a Shawnee Indian Chief who fought with Chief Little Turtle. Little Turtle, anyone know Little Turtle? Tecumseh? Yeah. Tecumseh? Yeah, yeah, okay, so Chief Blue Jacket fought here locally. It's the only reason. Had nothing to do with their prison garbs, not the color of his brown, anyways. <laughs> so, yeah. Orange. So, uh, orange, yeah, orange for the local county. Um, Blue Jacket was, was created to be entrepreneurial. And some of the lessons that I learned when I launched as executive director was me on a card table and a laptop, and we received two grants to launch. One was a Department of Justice, one was a Department of Labor grant. Department of Justice grant said, hey, if, you're, uh, if you want to be entrepreneurial, we'll give you some seed money, go in and remodel some houses, and meanwhile, why don't you train your men and women to become contractors and push them into the skilled trades? That's a beautiful concept, isn't it? It was still grant funded, and I had to become a contractor. It was me sitting at a card table laptop, and I grew to about 18 employees overnight. One of the biggest mistakes that I've ever made in my entire life. I outgrew the company and the mission. So we scrapped the construction enterprise, still paying for those sins today. Still own two of those houses. We sold off five. Uh, but we realized that we needed to focus on a lot of other industries that people wanted to get into. And people want to get into the industrial trades and do advanced manufacturing. So we have a wonderful relationship with Ivy Tech. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars that are sifted that we're paying for people to go receive welding training and, and uh, black belt, or what is it, green belt training and QS9000. And so we're pushing people in the industrial trades and still construction, but we, we tabled that. We launched with a Department of Labor grant serving youth, but still our skill is uh, adults because youth have a different mission to, uh, to become employed. And then uh, over, the, over the course of the next five years, we made, a, we made a core conviction, we meaning the board of directors and I, made a core conviction that to be a social enterprise, that means that we generate income and the money goes into our lake homes, right? Goes into our pocketbooks. Marshall, how many lake homes do you have? It has to be redirected into the program. But right now we have, and see, we, we, ha we keep having these carrots dangled right in front of us. We made the conviction that we're going to become 95% self-sufficient 95 self with our earned income. So we charge the local criminal justice system to send people to us. 
We charge the clients $30 who come in our front door. Of course, they get three really nice suits and shirts. If any of you want to donate, that's a way to get involved. Uh, we give them suits for free, but we still charge them a $30 entrance fee, every single person. They're with us for 60 days upon graduation. They're with us for life. We walk with them for life. We never guarantee them the job. We don't do the fishing for them. You saw that on the video. We don't guarantee them a job. But after they graduate the 60-hour training, uh, I'll tell you, the third way that we generate income is through our temp agency. It's called Opportunity Staffing. It's a, it's a low-risk hire. It, we compete with all the other temp agencies in the world, and we're selling icebergs in Florida. It's exactly what we're doing. That's what all my friends say. Are you selling icebergs today, Tony? You're selling a felon to an employer? And you know what? They end up being better employees than any other temp agency can provide. Because once we make one sale, they always have us. They always have us. And it's such a wonderful benefit to us to have opportunity staffing. But, but now, I'm, I'm battling with just saying no to one of our biggest temptations, and that was another federal grant. It was a Department of Labor prisoner reentry grant. It's $1 million. And I'm in my third year of this $1 million contract, and I almost said no to it yesterday, and I think I might on Monday. Because I've had to hire nine employees under this, under this grant that it's gonna go away in February. And I'd rather be self-sustaining. So what the Board of Directors has now done for Blue Jacket, and hopefully can do for you, is that they're starting to dispatch our staff and me to be able to go out and provide the capacity for other people to serve people with felony offenses. How to confront ambivalence. How to empower and transform people with their ability to gain a second chance. It's all in the approach. But remember, people coming home from prison, 30% of them have a mental health issue. Another 30, in, in that 30% have a reading or learning disability. And they have a lot of other social issues that they need to be dealing with as well. We've learned a lot of lessons in those five years. We'd like to be able to provide that to you, if that's an option. And, uh, uh, and that's where we are now generating our first level of income, is by cons consultation and training. So of those 22 counties around the state that have said, we need a Blue Jacket to franchise in our county, and we say, no, not yet, we want to get good in Fort Wayne, we realize we're getting good in Fort Wayne. We're not the best that we can be, but we're getting good in Fort Wayne. And we'll tell you about our best practices and we'll sell you our services, all these lessons that we've learned and researched and implemented in the last few years. So uh, another last thing you're probably wondering, okay, you help with employment. Our employment rate, 65% of, of the people from the day that they start are employed within the first quarter of starting. So that's a high number for us. Uh, we would like it to be 80%. It's a high number in this economy, but that's where we are sitting right now at Blue Jacket. Normally I open it up for questions, but I think you just want me to leave, don't you? <laughs> <laughs>